thank you both again for sharing some time with me. Um, so you asked about my background. I am an attorney. Um, I practice from Scottsdale and I work with clients all over the United States. I've been practicing uh, in this area of law for going on two decades. The sole focus of my practice is asset protection, wealth preservation, and risk management for high net worth individuals. Um, the book of people that I work with includes a couple of thousand physicians that my partners and I protect. And then we have uh, the other higher net worth part of our client base is typically private business owners, folks who are uh, in every kind of business that you can imagine from real estate investors like developers and builders to owners of service companies, folks who manufacture things, um, you name it, they do it. I got into this area of the law after, like many attorneys, starting on the litigation side. So I used to be the bad guy, so to speak. Uh, and started in uh, out of law school in civil litigation practice where I was the one suing people. And part of that experience um, is what brought me to where I am today, because I quickly understood that lawsuits were as much about collectability of the defendant as they were about liability for the thing that we were complaining about, whatever that may have been, whether it was a contract dispute or a personal injury claim or a dispute over uh, a business deal, whatever it was, the most collectible defendants were the most aggressively pursued. And I love seeing people succeed. So I decided about 20 years ago that I would rather protect successful American business owners and physicians like the people in my family, like the people I grew up with, then hurt them and take things away from them. So that's kind of how I got to where we are today. So the, the majority of, of people that that need this help is practically, um, you know, wealthy people, I guess, and uh, and small business owners. Yes, I mean that that's a a good part of it. And of course, nothing is more subjective than wealth, right? What is wealthy to one person is not uh, perhaps wealthy to another person with a much higher net worth. So whatever the person that I am talking to has is important to them, right? Uh, and that, therefore, it is important to me. And so we treat all of those people, regardless of their net worth, the same way in terms of making sure that we're taking the steps that are appropriate for them financially and legally where they are to help them lock in whatever level of success that they've had so they never have to make the same money twice. You saw a lot of that. You mentioned that you moved to New York shortly after the 2008 recession started. And we saw the fortunes of some of the most successful people in the United States change overnight. Um, you know, we had folks who were worth in excess of $100 million who were bankrupted by leveraged real estate debt in some cases. We had other folks like the millionaire next door who maybe had one or two rental houses or had bought a lot to build a spec home on, um, maybe had some business financing, uh, maybe had some deals go sour because there wasn't financing available or investors wanted to pull out because they were scared. So lots of bad things happened to good people who were good at making money and had done so predictably for years. Um, but fortunes changed with the economy and there was nothing anybody could do about that. So yes, it's for wealthy people, but as I said, wealth is relative and it's a little counterintuitive because some, of course, somebody with a 10 or 20 or $30 million net worth needs to think about this. But if we're talking to a 50 or 60 year old person who is quote unquote, only worth a couple of million dollars at whatever age they're at, that money is even more important to them than the same amount of money would be to somebody with a much higher net worth, right? So the $2 million guy is much easier to bankrupt than the $30 million guy. Both of them need to think about this. Let's start with that that smaller, I would say smaller net worth person. In normal cases, most of their net worth is resides in the home, in the house. Um, so if 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 we can think about that first, like what what are the typical things that could drive someone to to need asset protection? Um, like what are the risk factors? Uh, and the other option, the other thing I want to talk about is okay. So let's say we identify those risks. What is the most common way of protecting that for that type of person? 
who just has, you know, the house is maybe 80% of their net worth and they have a mortgage attached to it where if something happens to the house, they lose, you know, they're still liable for the mortgage. And so, you know, they go belly up. Right. And that's a good question. It's a very common question, especially where I am and where Robinson is here in the Southwest and in Phoenix and Scottsdale in particular, where we've seen explosive growth in home values and home equity uh, over the last two years in particular. It is one of the most important questions we deal with all the time. So we look at home equity, which is which is a big part of your question. And we figure out, first of all, what exactly is exposed. And so most people need to understand what the homestead protection in their state is. In Arizona, for instance, it's $250,000. In a couple of states, it's unlimited. And in in some states, it's as low as $5,000, right? So it's all over the board, depending on what state you live in and which state you are a taxpayer in where you have your primary residence, right? So there are a lot of folks who say, well, I have a home in Phoenix and I have another home in Florida. And um, therefore, I'm going to use my Florida home with its unlimited homestead exemption. Well, the law doesn't actually agree with you. It's going to depend on where your primary residence is and where you're a taxpayer and some other important details. So we look at what's the value of the home? What is the uh, homestead exemption provided by the state? We look at what kind of mortgage they have. So if you have a million dollar home with a $250,000 homestead like in Arizona and a half million dollar loan outstanding on it, well, then you only have $250,000 in exposed equity, right? So maybe that person um, is not as exciting a target to a plaintiff's attorney because the attorney will have to pay them their 250, pay off the bank that 500, and then try and take whatever extra equity is there. That's a lot of time and money and expense. That's not an attractive target. So maybe that person's home, at least at those numbers, is self-protected. Whereas if we have the same home value, a million dollar home, um, or a home that's worth over a million dollars, and most of my clients have seven figure homes. Um, and if that home is paid off or has a very significant amount of equity, then we look at what is the right structure to put that in. That could be a trust structure. Um, if it's a personal residence, if it's a family vacation home, we use a different form of a trust called a qualified personal residence trust, where we create that as a legacy property. Um, and there are other very sophisticated trust forms that we use for the highest net worth clients that allow them to have multiple high equity homes held in an irrevocable trust and which still allow them to keep both mortgage interest deductions and capital gains benefits. So the planner has to sit down and look at all of these details and figure out which pill is the right one for this particular ailment, right? And so there are lots of different options. Part of your question was also about risk, and I think risk factors, maybe. Um, so what one of the things that we do is we look at how risky is this person? What do they do? How many risks do they have that we can identify? And that also helps us determine how heavy the planning needs to be and how far we need to go. And, uh, you know, we can talk about some of those specific risks if you like. When I look at a normal person and let's say, you know, he, they, they have a home, they, um, oh, normal, <laughs> it's hard to define normal these days, but let's say he's a professional, he's a CPA, works for a big, uh, big accounting firm. Um, risk is kind of, and the wife is maybe a physician for a big hospital work. It, they're, they're kind of protected from malpractice liability. I'm trying to imagine what could go wrong in that situation versus someone who's a small business owner and takes, you know, additional risk? That's a great question. And it's a very common question. And it's also a common mistake people make. So of course, your example CPA, who's a licensed professional, has professional liability. So does his spouse, the physician. And yes, she has a little bit of a shield working for a hospital, but she can also be named personally. Um, in, in a legal action. And certainly, you know, she is not as exposed as if she was a, a sole practitioner or a partner in a practice or something else. But great. We understand that both of those people have professional liability. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is looking only at that big flashing red light that's on their personal risk dashboard, right? So all of my builders are worried about construction defect claims. 
All of my doctors are worried about medical malpractice claims. All of my transportation company owners are worried about accidents. And then we say, look, you need to take a step back from that and think of yourself as a three-dimensional being who is not just a doctor, lawyer, CPA, builder, whatever it is. When we ask some really basic questions, I have a list of risk factors. And when I go down this list, people are shocked at how many items on this list actually apply to them. So my questions about risk are, do you own a home? Do you own a, do you own a car? Do you have children? Do those children drive? Um, are you a licensed professional with professional liability? Are you a business owner that has that whole set of 100 different liabilities that come with owning a business? Are you an employer? Have you solicited third parties to invest in your project like a real estate developer might, right? Have you made financial and legal representations upon which others rely? Do you have assets that would be difficult or impossible to replace like a family business or inherited family real estate that has come through generations? Could be a farm, could just be that your grandfather was smart enough to buy half of the empty county next door before everybody needed to build there, right? So all of these different things factor into what what is this person's risk level? Um, and, you know, doctors in particular, we talk about, I, I say when I teach doctors, uh, I teach CME, continuing medical education on risk management and asset protection to doctors. I warn them that doctors suffer from an ailment called risk myopia, where they only see that one professional risk and ignore the entire rest of their life. But when we talk to the average doctor, they're typically also a real estate investor Maybe they've got a rental home, they've got an office building, they invested in a lab or a surgery center with a couple of their physician partners. So that is a heck of a lot wider scope of liability than all I'm worried about is a med mal claim. Does that make sense? 100%. Um, I like how I, we're using myself as an example here. <laughs> <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting some, some free high level uh, assessment here, Gabe. <laughs> Yeah. I'll be very honest. I think most people will look at it and says, Oh, you need, you need to protect, you know, your professional liability. And then also, um, if something, you know, um, at the end of the day, people will recommend like umbrella to protect you from excess liability in the car and at home. But other than that, I think most people, they block off other risk factors. Uh, I think you're completely right there. I agree 100%. And look, I'm I'm all for insurance. I don't sell insurance, but I am responsible for a massive amount of premium dollars being spent every year with insurance companies because I tell my clients that insurance is your first line of defense. It is your one of your most predictable lines of defense in terms of knowing what it will do for you. Uh it is one of the most cost-effective lines of asset protection and dollar for dollar, but we can't insure our way out of every single thing, right? There is not insurance available for everything and things that we can be insured for, we are often not adequately insured. So we routinely see gaps in insurance in either the width of the coverage, which I refer to as how many different things are we actually covered for, or the depth of the coverage, meaning the dollar amount. Right. So I'll ask somebody, for instance, maybe a CPA who's a client. And I do have CPAs and attorneys as clients who own their firms. And I will ask them, do you have data breach insurance? And they will say, yes, we have that as part of our general liability coverage. And then we find out that that's actually only a $20,000 rider that was added to their basic business liability coverage when it should be a million dollars or more. And you know, you have social security numbers, account numbers, all kinds of sensitive information that would be disastrous if exposed or if you were held up for ransomware or something else, right? So we find that, you know, either people don't have the coverage, all the coverage they need, or they think they have coverage which isn't adequate. And so all of these issues are part of the questions that we ask when we're talking about asset protection. I want to ask you about something that we didn't get to discuss the last time we, we spoke, uh, but I, I, I sense uh, basically cornered a, a personal injury attorney at a social gathering and uh, <laughs> made him tell me about 
the process of um, kind of defining collectability, which you talked about earlier, being like co- liability being one thing and collectability being it's a whole other can of worms. And I was interested in this because uh, it feels to me that there are kind of channels or there are methods by which plaintiff's attorneys can can really find out more about what's going on financially with someone they're thinking about suing, right? Th- thinking about pursuing for X, Y, or Z thing going on. Um, could you tell me a, a little bit about what you know about kind of the, the privacy aspect of that or the, or the, the public nature of uh, people's wealth and the, the channels? Um, do you have any secrets to spill about the channels through which plaintiff's attorneys actually find their info? They have a variety of, of sophisticated resources at their, expo- at their disposal, ranging from uh, access to internet databases all the way up through the use of private investigators, right? Those are the those are the heavy duty things when they when they think there's something there or they really want to know um, what somebody has. But you know, frankly, guys, it's it's not often that complicated. We as Americans like to stamp our name on everything we own, right? So you can go on the internet and discover what properties are recorded to to a person as the owner. Um, Without any kind of special access, you can discover uh, what corporations and LLCs are registered to them in many cases. Um, we routinely see people buy multi-million dollar homes uh, or homes in, in Arizona. As you know, Robinson, that we have the local um, Phoenix Business Journal, right? And in the back of that business newspaper every week, we have a list of home sales over half a million dollars. And it has them broken down, half a million to a million, million to, you know, and in segments. And you can see who bought the home, what the home pr- was priced, what the address is, things like that. So we, we warn people about a couple of different things. Number one, there is no such thing as secret. Any attorney that uses the word secret is an idiot or a liar. There are, okay, there is no such thing as secret in the law. Any asset protection plan that relies on secrecy relies on the hope that no one will find or ask you about the asset, like in, an, like in a debtor's exam or with interrogatories or in a deposition. And if you are asked, it relies on your willingness to commit perjury and lie about it. And in some cases, your willingness to commit tax evasion, because that's the paper trail that leads us back to assets. That's not how real grownups do this. That's not how professionals do this. Yes, there is such a thing as privacy. and You used the right word when you said privacy. So can we register holding companies in a way that they are not easily publicly discoverable with an internet search? Yes. Um, can we buy a home privately without having to put your name in the newspaper? Yes. We do those things for people all the time. The other side of that is if you are asked about, do you have this asset? or tell us every property you own, or disclose every trust, partnership, corporation that you are an officer, member, director, or beneficiary of, you better answer that question. Um, That doesn't make the plan any less effective. So yes, from a tactical perspective, it is good to look smaller than you are and to not have those assets as easily discoverable with just an internet search. And most of the time, if you want to know who somebody is and what they have, especially with social media, just look at their, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, things like that. You can discover their cars, their jewelry, their watches. And of course, those who hold crypto assets, um, those people never shut up about it, right? Because part of the crypto experience is hyping what you've put, what you've put your money in all the time. So the big crypto investors are always talking about, you know, crypto, crypto, crypto. If I want to know if somebody has crypto assets, I'm just going to the first thing I'm going to look at is their Facebook and their Instagram. Um, so it's sometimes these things are self-inflicted injuries. Uh, in many cases, people need to learn to be a little more private and they need to ask, are there ways we can hold this that make it a little tougher to find? And then the next question is, if it is found, Have we taken real steps that will put those assets out of reach and make those assets legally distinct from our personal and professional liability? Have we done something real besides the smokescreen? I'm the first one to say to people, hey, yes, we can give you some privacy, 
But that's not what we're relying on. We're relying on the fact that your homes are in an irrevocable trust. We're relying on the fact that the significant investment portfolio that Robinson is managing for you is in a limited partnership, which is owned by an which is owned by an irrevocable trust. As one common example of you know a setup we might put in place for somebody who's financially qualified, and those tools have a legal effect that goes far beyond privacy. Well said. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for going through that, Gabe. You got another one up. I want to try to discern what are like common ways that um, I would say the common person can use to minimize because you can protect your property through insurance, but you can also protect it through like devising ways that makes it hard to collect, right? Like those are two things that you can do. I don't know if there's a third one that, that diminishes the probability of you getting sued and or being an attractive person for being sued. You talked about privacy also, but is there anything else that someone can do easily to just decrease the probability of, you know, of, of entering into this? Because the moment you go into a lawsuit is already very stressful, right? Like that's, it just, it's not a pleasant experience. So just avoiding that to start is, I guess, not engaging in risky behaviors, maybe. <laughs> well, you, 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 Gabe, you took my best material <laughs> um, because you, you just stated the answer. And let me repeat it back to you. And, and when you hear it, I think it will make sense. So I talk about when I teach asset protection to attorneys or financial advisors or CPAs or doctors or whoever I'm talking about, I talk about the three layers of asset protection. And the first one is one, the last thing that you just said, which is avoiding the harm, right? That's the first rule of the martial arts is not win the fight, it's avoid the fight wherever possible, right? So smart people who are experienced in battle don't want to be in fights in the first place. So the first the first rule of asset protection that I teach is what I call clean living, uh, which basically in lawyer, CPA, and advisor speak means compliance. Let's not do stupid things that get us sued. Let's not that or l- allow others for whom we bear or share responsibility to do those things either. That could be the rogue business partner that isn't fully compliant in some way with the law or your company's own internal policies. It could be um, your spouse with a spending problem. It could be your teenager with a reckless driving, <laughs> reckless driving habits. It is important that we avoid the harm as the first layer of defense. And that means leadership. That means compliance. That means rules. Um, that sometimes means being the bad guy. And this is the hardest thing for any of us as advisors to teach anybody is to tell them to um, have rules, set boundaries, enforce the rules, things like that. But that is really the most important thing. And the hardest thing to protect people from is themselves. The next layer of asset protection is let's be insured against any mistakes. And you mentioned, for instance, that you can insure your property for liability. And yes, I agree that in many cases, we can very heavily insure ourselves against the internal liability of owning our home or owning a commercial building or owning an apartment building or two rental houses or whatever we're lucky enough to have. But that will not protect us from the external liability, right? So your internal liability insurance policy will not protect you if you are being sued for something else and I want that asset from you and you are holding that asset in your own name. Well, that insurance policy was moot. It doesn't apply in this case, right? Your slip and fall policy at your building is not going to protect me from my claim against you for running me over with your car, right? As one very simple um, example. Uh, And then the third layer of asset protection is let's have the legal tools in place. If our compliance and our leadership doesn't work and there's a gap in our insurance, either because we weren't covered for that thing or it couldn't be insured or we didn't have enough insurance, then yes. Let's have legal tools in place that make our assets and our liabilities legally distinct from each other. And there are a variety of different tools that we use for that. We use some tools as holding companies for passive financial assets. We use LLCs as wrappers for income producing real estate. We then make sure that the client doesn't own that LLC because the money that comes out of the LLC is still exposed when the distribution comes to them, right? So that's a very common thing that I deal with here in Arizona. We have lots of folks who have multiple income producing rental properties. 
And they'll walk into my office and say, I've got this covered, I think. I don't know why I'm here. My CPA said I had to come see you and he wouldn't shut up until I did. And I've got all this wrapped up. I've got five LLCs and a trust. And I'll say, okay, uh, the trust is the owner of the LLCs. Is that your revocable living trust? And they'll nod very proudly. And I'll have to explain to them that the revocable living trust doesn't provide any creditor protection. It's a great death planning tool, but not a good life planning tool. So in that case, what we do is we make sure that another entity, not the revocable living trust, owns those LLCs and can safely receive the income that comes out of them and hold that income, re reinvest it, or, or make a distribution to the client. Now, that's one very specific example and one very specific fact pattern, but you know, it just shows you that there are layers to this, to doing it right. And one of the things we warn people about is you can't just insure or just hire a lawyer. It has to be a holistic approach to doing this right. And that includes everything from tax planning and investment planning to insurance planning and legal tools. My comment was, if you put stuff in a revocable trust, you're by and large, uh, going to be paying a higher tax rate than if you had it in, in a revocable trust, unless that taxpayer is already in the highest tax bracket, right? From an income producing. There are many irrevocable trust structures that can be used for asset protection. The kind of trust structure that we commonly use because our clients do have income producing assets is a, a, self-settled spendthrift grantor trust. So it doesn't change their tax filing status or their tax bracket. Everything's a pass through. Yeah. Um, you know, the CPAs love that. And it allows clients to have a structure that can receive income from 10 different sources without changing their life in the way that you you've described. Oh, uh, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's a whole different world. It really is. Um, I got, I, I want to ask you a couple kind of uh, kind of high level ones because we see this in the in the news from time to time, and we see as you're talking about, like you mentioned, the compliance thing, which I think of broadly as like, especially if you're a business owner, it's kind of culture, right? The culture of compliance or the culture of maybe recklessness. Um, and <laughs> two examples come to mind of just kind of like uh, celebrity founders that. Uh, I'm sure made their lawyers head spin and I'm sure um, would have if they had hired you too. First is the founder of Uber. I don't know if you've read the book or seen the the series uh, Super Pumped about the the history and the, the skirting of the law, but the, the, uh, the aggression with which Uber went forward on the, the gray edge of the law. I mean, I don't know. Someone can maybe comment on the actual legality of everything that was done, but uh, kind of famously touting regulations in pursuit of growth and market domination. Um, and <laughs> any comments on this? Have you read about this? Did it did it give you heartburn, or have you seen so much of this that it, it doesn't matter anymore? You know, I I haven't followed that specific example very closely. I've skimmed over a few you know headlines and things on social media. Um, and, you know, but I, I haven't watched the movie or read the book that you're referring to, but it is something that we see very often. And we warn folks that there are times where you are more vulnerable as a business owner, startups, um, and, and interestingly, at an exit as well, right? Because in my opinion, the biggest threat to the seller of a business is often the buyer. Right. So, for instance, if your client is selling a business and selling it to a large private equity group, um, that private equity group can outspend your client on legal fees all day, every day. And many of these groups, uh, if they are not able to be as successful with a business enterprise as they plan to be, they will find a reason, uh, whether it's true or not, that it's the seller's fault. And they will want to come back and get a refund or stop or stop a stream of payments or renegotiate a deal. And, you know, when the seller threatens legal action, the buyer's response is great. We can certainly outspend you. Right. So we want to make sure that folks are protected. Um, you know, asset protection is not a license to do harm. It is not a license to break the law or act irresponsibly. What it does do is make sure that 
when you have assets that you have earned um, in a legitimate way, when they are in your possession, you have a right to segregate them and ladder up like a barber chair to make sure that, you know, once you reach any level of success, you don't go down and have to start over. Um, it is great protection against frivolous claims. Uh, it is great protection against claims where your liability exceeds what you reasonably thought it should be. But, you know, if we would go back to the first level of asset protection being compliance and, and clean living, um, the things that you're talking about where folks are operating on the edge of the law, those folks are the most likely to need to use their tools or need the help. Um, unfortunately, many of those people don't investigate the strategies available until there's a crisis or until there's litigation. Um, and at that point, we're timed out. Right. Anything that we could have done under blue skies on a nice Wednesday afternoon um, that would have been completely legal becomes fraud if we act after the fact. And that is one of the big problems with the high flyers that you're talking about is they are moving so fast, working on their deals, making money, growing the company, moving from one thing to the next that their uh, their home, their bank their personal financial plan beyond getting rich is often not as detailed or well tended to as it should be. So you talked about um, this as being one of the one of the big mistakes people do is that after a fact, are the other big, big mistakes that you can talk to us about things we shouldn't? Yeah. Uh, in fact, I have a whole article called common fatal flaws of asset protection planning, where I bullet point about 10 or a dozen very common mistakes. The biggest one, without a doubt, the most important thing that you know, our conversation hopefully will impart on anyone today is timing. The biggest mistake is doing nothing. And we routinely talk to people who are worth anywhere from a million dollars to 50 or a hundred million dollars or more who literally don't have any kind of planning in place. And you wonder, well, they have lawyers, they have estate planners, they have accountants, they have all, they, all of these teams of people working around them. Why didn't, how could this have happened? How did this guy go the last 20 years and become worth X million dollars and nobody ever made him do this? Well, it's because partially it's not what they do, right? It's not their responsibility. The estate planner's goal is to transfer your assets at your death with a minimum estate tax exposure. The CPA's goal is to minimize taxes. The investment advisor's goal is to turn nickels into dimes. My job is to make sure that you get to keep the nickels and the dimes, right? So, so it's a slightly different approach to some of the same problems. Um, so biggest mistake, doing nothing. Second biggest mistake, I would say, is failing to adequately insure. I routinely turn away millionaires every month who call me after something as stupid and simple and basic as a car accident where they are informed that their liability will exceed their insurance coverage. And I say to these people, what do you mean you're worth $3 million and you have $300,000 in insurance on your car, right? So especially with something that cheap, I mean, a, an umbrella policy is dollar for dollar, the cheapest asset protection available. I tell all of my friends, family members, clients that $2 million is the minimum. If you're high net worth, it's often a multiple of that. Um, but anybody who's walking around, I'm talking about any any employed person who has a house and a car and a little bit of money in the bank should have a two million dollar umbrella policy is the minimum. Um, we see relying on strategies that uh, are the emperor's new clothes. I often talk to people who very proudly say, I'm not worried about asset protection. Uh, everything's in my wife's name. Well, if you're in a community property state like Arizona, um, if all you've done is title assets only in one spouse's name, that's completely ineffective. It's still community property. The second problem with that is that if we go further and do the right things like have a postnuptial agreement and a property transmutation agreement that says this $3 million house that we live in is now the sole and separate property of my wife. Well, there are a couple of problems with that as well. Um, number one, if you get divorced, that's really her property, and that will not be included in the rest of the estate to be divided at your divorce. The home is also subject to her own 
lawsuits, liabilities, bankruptcy, estate planning issues, everything else. So that is a completely ineffective way to do asset protection planning that creates a whole nother series of problems. Um, and if you get divorced after you've transferred a significant amount of property to your spouse, you cannot then go back and say, I was just kidding or we were lying when I made these official transfers and signed the deed and signed the paperwork and had this notarized and et cetera, et cetera. And we've seen people try and do that. We, there are actually cases out there where people have gone back and said, well, that was just an asset protection move. We didn't really mean it. Um, too late. It's done. Uh, other common fatal flaws of um, asset protection planning, relying only on insurance. As we said, there are many things that you can and should be well insured against. And there are many things that for which insurance is simply not available. So I am a huge proponent of insurance. I, I have a list of half a dozen kinds of basic uh, business insurance I go over with every business owner, but that alone is not enough. Uh, another common problem we see is one we've already discussed, relying on estate planning tools to be asset protection tools. You are using a saw when you should be using a hammer. Both are good tools, but they both have a very specific purpose. Um, you know, and, and there are many others, but those are those are probably the three or four biggest ones that we see on a routine basis. Um, you know, and the, the one one final one is using tools that are abusive tax evasion tools in asset protection wrappers. So I mean it is sold as an asset protection benefit, but it is actually being used as a tax shelter in in an abusive way. Um Captive insurance companies come to mind. It's an absolutely legitimate strategy for whom there is a fact pattern fit, but they are overtly sold, for instance, as um, as a tax shelter, right? So the folks who get in trouble for abusing them, their brochures and their websites overtly advertise them as tax shelters um, when they should be a risk management tool. Um, those are those are a few of the real common ones that I see. I can you speak briefly to I think there's maybe a misconception and I'm before I had spoken to you and learned much more about this, definitely guilty of just thinking that this was a helpful vector. The word offshore, we haven't mentioned it yet. I'm sure it comes up a ton in your conversations as maybe just a blanket <laughs> fix it all. We're going to, you know, it's all offshore. It's all in Switzerland or some island, right? Uh, can you just speak to that briefly to a lay person who doesn't maybe uh, doesn't have the context that you have? Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up. In fact, it's funny you brought that up. I have an article out today at Physicians Practice. Uh, I'm doing an ongoing series on trust, you know, trust 101. I'm up to part 11. And today's installment is uh, the use of the legal use of offshore trusts and banks. So offshore trust planning is a big part of what I do. But not every person I talk to is either financially qualified or emotionally qualified to, to use the offshore trusts uh, in the right way. Um, so let's talk about that. Offshore trusts are neither secret nor are they tax-free. So those are the two biggest myths. Um, we've already discussed the idea that you know any anything that relies on secrecy will fail. Um, having money in an offshore bank account without having the wrapper of typically an irrevocable trust around it is not asset protection. If the if you have a foreign bank account in Switzerland or Liechtenstein or in the Caribbean in you know in some sun-kissed island that you like to visit, that's great. But if you have direct control over the account and the account is titled in your own name and you are a US resident in a US court, when you when the court becomes aware of those assets, they will simply order you to repatriate them, right? So that is ineffective. So you, if you are going to use offshore trusts and banks for asset protection planning, the account should be owned by an irrevocable trust. The trustee is ideally outside the United States. Um, the bank is a bank that does not have a U.S. presence, so we don't use Credit Suisse and UBS and all of these banks that so you can just go to New York or California or wherever else and walk into an office and serve them. We want 
um, very solvent, reputable offshore banks that do not have a U.S. presence. Um, the any offshore account is fully reported. The first thing that happens if we have a client who wants to open an offshore trust and an offshore bank account to go with it is they have to fill out a bunch of KYC paperwork. It's about 14 pages of disclosure for the offshore bank and trust companies to know who you are, to know that you're not a criminal, that you have to provide proof of residency, you have to provide your social security number, you have to send them a W-9. So a lot of the misconception about offshore trusts and banking is, in fact, this is in the article I put out today, that cons many consumers have this image of bond girls with you know briefcases full of money and bikinis hopping on private jets and flying to fabulous islands with turquoise waters. I wish it was that that was the case. Uh, <laughs> I wish that's paperwork. what I got. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wish that's what I got to do for a living. What most of it is is three guys like us sending paperwork back and forth to make sure that our our compliance is perfect, our disclosures to the IRS are full and complete, that we've gotten the bank and the trust company to accept the American client, and that we have proved who this person is, what the source of their wealth is. We've answered all the questions to their satisfaction because they don't want to be when in business with criminals, tax evaders, people running guns, drugs, drug money, whatever it is. They don't want anything to do with that. So um, they don't take just anybody. Um, there are jurisdictions and banks that will take anybody. You can walk into Panama with $5 million in your suitcase, which is why we would never do business there, right? We are we don't want to be in a jurisdiction that is pejorative just by its nature, um, where, you know, that, oh, if you're in that jurisdiction, that's where bad people who couldn't do business with a legit bank end up. That is the impression that's given. So we want to make sure that those things are done right. Um, so you weren't affected it, by it, the Panama Papers leak is what I'm hearing. Yeah, people, it had absolutely nothing to do with us. And we just sat back and laughed at it because in many cases, the biggest mistake when you see these big cases, the Panama Papers, these other things where you see certain banks that, you know, blow up or you read about, you know, 50 American doctors can, uh, accused of tax evasion. Do you know that the simple mistake they made was they simply opened an account and didn't fill out the tax paperwork? In some cases, there isn't even any tax due. If you earn taxes, uh, if you earn profits in an offshore bank account or investment account, you report the income and you pay your taxes here. End of story. Most of the people who you see in the news simply committed basic, stupid tax evasion. And not only did they not adequately protect the assets, they created additional legal jeopardy that they should never have been part of in the first place. And if somebody had filled out a tax form, they never would have been in trouble. So, you know, um, offshore planning is absolutely, I think, the safest and most effective. Um, the assets are outside the reach of the U.S. court system. The trust is in a jurisdiction that is hostile to any foreign judgment. Um, the trustee is outside the reach of the U.S. court system. Um, and the client literally has just placed those assets in a place where they can't be reached domestically. It is the most predictable and the strongest when it's done right. It is also the most expensive way to do it. So there are financial qualifications that make sense. Typically, I don't do this that kind of planning for anybody who doesn't have seven figures in liquidity um, or who isn't expecting seven figures or more in, in liquidity um, and who doesn't have significant other assets that we can protect by using those structures as well. So there is a financial benchmark. And up to that point, we use more conventional domestic tools. And when somebody reaches that level of success, we can add that on top of it and make it even stronger. So it is rarely the case that everything somebody owns is in an offshore trust. They will always have domestic assets. Those need domestic tools to hold them and manage them and protect them and point them at their estate plan. And then maybe if that person is lucky enough to have a very significant amount of liquidity, we'll move some of that um, offshore and securitize it so that they know if everything that could go wrong goes wrong, they still have that protected nest egg that they set up at a time when it was completely legal for them to do so. Offshore structures be incredibly compliance heavy. It is, it's not so much the tax side, it is the relationship between um, maintaining just good you know, 
good standing with the banks, um, with the brokers. Uh, all of it requires an em- enormous amount of paperwork just to uh, just to operate, uh, and it just becomes very painful. Not not for the person, mostly for the for the people serving that person. <laughs> <laughs> You sound like you filled out a couple of 3520As in your time. Uh, I have filled out. It's not so much that. It's just <laughs> the on, the annual compliance for every single corporate entity, with, let's say, within a trust, right? Like, it's just very painful. And you rely on other people who are very slow. And there are ways that good planners know to streamline that process and make that part of it cost-effective and time-effective for their for the client and their advisors. So in many cases, our offshore trust structures own a domestic LP, and that LP files a tax return, and all of the other assets, um, you know, their their tax reporting is merged into that. So it makes it much simpler for um, for our clients and and for the clients of many other planners who know how to do set up those pass throughs in a way where they are effective and simple to maintain. Um, and to where the offshore entities uh, aren't in control of those and don't have the liability and the co- and the compliance burden of those domestic entities either. I, I I can't thank you enough for for coming on for sharing all this knowledge with us. I know you do this professionally and you charge for it. So any viewers out there, <laughs> you should know this costs money in the in almost any other context. Uh, we got it to you for the the low cost of of nothing today. Um, we'll make sure to put Ike's contact info. He's got a great informative website. He posts a ton of content on this subject. So follow him on Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, He's constantly staying up on it. But thank you guys for viewing. Thank you, Ike, again for coming on. And we'll see you guys next time. My pleasure.